Hello everybody, hello, hello, hello. I hope all is well with you. It's a good day, it's Friday, which is great. Who doesn't like Friday? I got my psychic tailor here. And now he's over there. So I'm gonna be reading a couple more chapters of The Ghostly Tales of Connecticut by Ellie O'Ryan. Sit back, lay down, relax, and enjoy the tales. So we left off at chapter six, The Bride and the Soldier. A terrible sadness descended upon the Daniel Benton homestead in 1777. It is a cloud of grief and longing so thick that it still lingers. Two young lovers who encountered great trials and tribulations in life only to be cruelly separated by death linger there too. Daniel Benton's grandson, Elisha, fell in love with pretty Jemima Barrows as soon as he saw her. Sorry about that. Jemima was much younger than Elisha, more than 10 years, but that did nothing to stop his powerful affection for her. Alas, from the first moment Elisha laid eyes on Jemima, their love was doomed. As they hailed from different social classes, the Benton family was well-to-do while Jemima's father was only a cabinet maker. The Bentons would never approve a union between Elisha and Jemima. But love knows no such practicalities, and Elisha vowed that one day he would make Jemima his wife. When Jemima returned his affections and accepted his secret proposal, Elisha knew that his dreams would come true. Even as he enlisted in the army and prepared to fight in the Revolutionary War, Elisha's heart was light. Someday he knew the war would end. Someday he would return home. Someday he would return to Jemima and they would build a beautiful life together. Unfortunately, Elisha was only partly right. While Elisha was at war, Jemima stayed home and dreamed of their future. She carefully filled their, her hope chest with linens and other necessities they would need in their new home. Perhaps she even sewed a bridal gown to wear on their wedding day. All these preparations she believed would help the time go faster until the war ended and Elisha returned to her. During the Battle of Long Island, Elisha and his two brothers were captured by British forces and forced onto a prison ship that was anchored near Brooklyn, New York. The conditions on the ship were deplorable. Men were crammed into crowded spaces aboard the ship with little fresh air and less room to move. There was not enough food to go around, and all too often the food was rotten or infested by rodents. The stench was unbearable. It's no wonder that, when the dreaded smallpox virus arrived on the ship, it tore through the prisoners like wildfire. One by one, Elijah's brothers became ill and succumbed to the deadly disease. Then it was Elisha's turn. His skin burned with fever. Blisters in his mouth and throat made it impossible for him to swallow, let alone eat and drink. Fluid-filled sores erupted all over his body, leaking pus onto his bedclothes. When it came time for the British forces to select a prisoner for exchange, the ailing Elijah was an easy choice. After all, they figured he'd be dead soon enough anyway. The cart that carried Elisha back to the Benton house rattled over the roads. Elisha moaned softly, only half aware of what was happening and where he was going. His family should have rejoiced to welcome Elisha home, but as soon as they saw how gravely ill he was, their celebrations turned into preparations of a different sort. Knowing all too well that smallpox was extremely contagious, they immediately walled off a section of the house where Elijah would quarantine all alone while everyone waited for him to survive the virus or succumb. 
Elijah wasn't alone for long. As soon as word reached Jemima that her beloved had returned, she made haste to the Benton home where she discovered Elisha in a sorry state. The Bentons warned Jemima that she must not go near him or risk catching the contagion, but she refused to heed their pleas, pushing past them to enter the quarantine room without delay. Elisha, through his feverish haze, recognized his betrothed and smiled weakly. Jemima dropped to the floor and took his hot, dry hand in hers. She kissed it and reached for the, waist, the wash basin, where she wrung out a rag and pressed it to Elisha's chapped lips. It was the first drop of water he'd had in hours. Soon after, Jemima's parents arrived to offer their prayers of support to the Benton family in their time of need. Oh, the horror Mr. and Miss Barrows felt when they realized their precious daughter had arrived at the Benton house before them and had exposed herself to the terrible contagion. They refused to go near her or let her come home. There was little hope for Jemima now, they feared. As for Jemima, she wasn't afraid. She wouldn't have gone home even if her parents had welcomed her with open arms. She knew where she belonged, at the bedside of her betrothed. Elijah lingered for days, and true to her word, Jemima never faltered in her devotion, not even when the first flush of fever crept onto her cheeks and the ache settled into her bones. When, she, when he died on January 21st, Jemima was still with him, still holding his hand, his family still so terrified of the dreadful virus that had taken Elijah's life had his lifeless body passed through a window in his tiny quarantine room rather than carry it through the rest of the house and spread contagion from room to room. They did not take down the makeshift wall they built, not yet. For now, Jemima lay atop Elijah's deathbed, burning with fever, covered from head to toe with weeping crusted pox. She lingered for more than a month, suffering just as Elisha did. Perhaps Jemima suffered even worse because through the throes of her illness, there was no one there to wipe her brow or hold her hand. Jemima Barrows died all alone. Since Jemima and Elijah had never had the opportunity to get married, they could not be buried beside each other. A road separates them in death, just as war, strife, and sickness separated them in life. Perhaps this cruel burial arrangement was the final indignity. Sorry. Was the final indignity that Jemima and Elijah would be forced to suffer. Perhaps this is why they cannot rest peacefully in their graves. Not long after Elijah and Jemima passed from this world to the next, members of the Benton family began to hear ghostly footsteps echoing through the corridors, even when no one was moving. Sometimes the hearth began to glow as if a warm blaze crackled within it, even when there was no fire. Sometimes the figure of a woman in a bridal gown is seen gliding from one room to the next. Sometimes the specter of a, co a colonial soldier is spotted pacing the halls, almost as if he is searching for someone. Even visitors to the distant graves of Elisha and Jemima can feel a deep sense of sadness settle over them or a creeping sense of unease as though someone were watching them from beyond. Perhaps it is the spirits of Jemima and Elisha themselves wondering if someone, anyone, will acknowledge their love at last. Chapter 7 Tori Den not all the colonists believed in the cause of the Revolutionary War. British loyalists were called Tories, and they believed that England was far too powerful to rise against. As a result of their loyalty to the British crown, the Tories were hated by the revolutionaries. There was such a large number of Tories in Connecticut that the revolutionaries feared they endangered the future of the United States. The revolutionaries had to hunt down the Tories to prevent them from sabotaging their battles for independence. Captured Tories were interrogated, punished, and subjected to 
conversion tactics that were so fearful they were spoken of only in whispers. Even if a Tory was cleared of treason, he faced abuse and harassment from his neighbors. There were reports of Tories being shot at or tarred and feathered. A Tory convicted of treason faced the prospect of death by hanging. Is it any wonder the Tories did everything they could to avoid capture? The Tory dens, located throughout Connecticut, were perhaps their most important secret weapon. This network of caves provided a safe shelter for Tories when revolutionaries searched for them from door to door and town to town. Tory wives kept a careful eye on the roads, watching for any sign that a band of revolutionaries, such as the Sons of Liberty, was on the march. If she spotted them, she might stand on the doorstep and blow into a conch shell. The low, mournful tone carried an urgent message, hide. Any Tories in the area who heard the cry of the conch, shell, conch shell knew what they had to do. Leaving their tools in the fields and their horses still saddled, the Tories would rush to the nearest Tory den. With swift, silent steps, they would approach the closest cave and slip through its gaping mouth into the secret shelter of the darkness within. Then they would wait. One of the most famous or perhaps infamous Tory dens was a unique structure created when a massive slab of rock fell onto two large stones, creating a natural chamber that appeared to have no entrance unless you knew where to look. This Tory den had a southeast entrance and an even more secretive central entrance that was just large enough for a person to squeeze through. At the north end, there was a cramped and tiny opening that was almost too small to use as an entrance. Almost. How many Tories would cram together in this hard, lonesome space? How long would they wait for a sign that the Sons of Liberty have moved on to other targets in other areas? Were they afraid? Were they hungry? Were they cold? Did they look at the small opening in the center of the cave and imagine building a small fire beneath where they could warm their stiff, numb fingers? Of course, they wouldn't dare build a fire. The puffs of smoke that spiraled out would be a sure giveaway. The hours must have felt endless. No one spoke a word of, for fear of being heard. The stony chamber had strange acoustics that would make even a whisper echo, like a shout. Perhaps, if it wasn't too dangerous, one of the wives would, could, would sneak away to the cave with a basket of food and water. How grateful the hiding men must have been to see her, to have something to eat, to have a sign that there was still a world outside this miserable cave, a world with family and food and sunlight, a world to which they might soon return and live freely and openly if they were lucky. One of the hardest parts of being a Tory sympathizer in New England must have been the relentless of the winters. Imagine the freezing caves during a harsh winter storm. Even a stack of carefully stashed woolen blankets and furs would do little to ward off the icy winds and bitter chill that seemed to seep into the rocky sides of the cave. It must have been hard in the bleakest, darkest days of winter for the Tories not to imagine that the cave was all too sim similar to a tomb dark and still and cold, so very, very cold. There was record of just one Tory being hanged for treason, but the fear that all Tories lived under during the years of the Revolutionary War likely changed them forever. Their senses were always alert. At any moment, they were watching the road for danger, listening for the warning of the conch shell crouching in the damp recesses of the cave, willing their hearts not to beat quite so loud or so fast. The interminable hours in the cave, waiting, waiting, waiting for capture or waiting for the moment to leave and risk everything, to return home, which meant returning to life on highest alert. The Tories are long dead, but the tensions and emotions they carried with them into the caves live on. Many hikers and explorers have reported seeing misty figures at the cave entrances slinking in and out. There, at a time, there are at times odd lights for which no human explanation can be found. Could they be ghostly fires? 
that the shivering Tories once longed to start. Voices still echo off the stone walls, and even the sounds of heavy, panicked breathing can be heard by those who listen carefully. Mostly tellingly, visitors to the Tory dens report a heavy, fearful presence that seems to infect them like a pathogen until they can bear it no longer and escape from the caves as quickly as possible. Perhaps even the stone walls of the caves absorb the heightened emotions of the Tories, who sought shelter and sanctuary within, like the damp condensation that brings such chill to the caves. All that fear and anxiety beads upon the stone walls and ceilings, dripping invisible droplets of terror onto all who gather in the Tory dens. Drip, drip, drip. Chapter 8. Fort Griswold's Gruesome Ghosts Sometimes places become haunted by spirits who cannot move on from their earthly lives to the realm beyond. Sometimes places become haunted because a terrible crime happened, happened there. Sometimes it's both. The Revolutionary War was a time of great bravery and triumph. A new country was born upon the I ideals of independence. But like all wars, the Revolutionary War showcased some of the worst elements of human behavior, cowardice, betrayal, treason, treachery, and even massacres. Fort Griswold was constructed to provide protection to the harbor ships and towns of Groton and New London. On September 6, 1781, the British invaded Groton and New London burning the towns one building at a time until the sky was black with smoke and the flames cast such terrible heat no one could set foot in either town. The devastation, though, was just beginning. As the towns burned, British Lieutenant Colonel Edmund Eyer led 800 troops to Fort Griswold. With the blazes raging and the smoke billowing through the sky, it was clear that the British forces had triumphed. When Colonel Eyre reached Fort Griswold, he acted according to all codes of military honor by sending forth a flag to demand a peaceful surrender. Twice the revolutionaries refused. Their commander, Colonel William Ledyard, was certain that reinforcements were on the, on the way. He was determined to hold the fort until they arrived, even if it cost the life of every last man under his command. His grave miscalculations would haunt Fort Griswold for centuries to come. At last, Colonel Eyer ran out of patience. He issued one more warning. When no surrender was forthcoming, the British stormed Fort Griswold. The two sides were not evenly matched. The British forces numbered 800, while only 150 revolutionaries were holed up within the walls of the fort. But the first wave of the attack proved lethal for the British as many soldiers were killed in their attempts to cross the deep ditch in front of the fort. Eventually, however, the British forces persevered and were able to invade. They forced open the heavy gates and marched right in. Despite being outnumbered more than four to one, Colonel Ledyard and his men made a brave show of attempting to hold off the British soldiers. Within 40 minutes, though, the battle was over. Colonel Ledyard had no choice but to surrender. Perhaps Colonel Ledyard had already forgotten his own refusal to play by the rules of war when Colonel Eyer and his men first approached Fort Griswold. Or perhaps Colonel Ledyard thought that the rules should apply to everyone but him. Regardless, it must have been a terribly unpleasant surprise when he presented his sword to Colonel Eyer in the customary gesture of honorable surrender, only to have Colonel Eyer turn Ledger's own sword on him, killing him immediately. The rest of the British forces showed no mercy to the remaining revolutionary troops, killing most of them where they stood. Then the British troops dumped the wounded soldiers into an artillery cart so they could quickly, if not carefully, transport them out of Fort Griswold. Why the rush? Well, the British wanted to blow up the fort's ammunition before revolutionary reinforcements could arrive and reclaim it. The cart piled high with the wounded and, and the dying must have been a miserable ride as it bumped and bounced along the road. 
Then the unthinkable happened. The British forces lost control of the cart, which careened down the hillside before crashing into a cluster of trees. The moans and screams of the wounded could be heard clear across the river. Of course, Americans remember the incident slightly differently. They claim the British did it on purpose. The crash was so severe that several of the wounded died in the wreck. The rest were hauled over to British prisoner ships and held captive in the same terrible conditions that led to the death of Elijah Benton. It is astonishing that any of them survived. And though the exact numbers are unknown, it is widely believed that 85 American soldiers and 51 British troops died on that fateful day at Fort Griswold. Their bodies were dumped in a shallow mass grave at the gates of the fort, barely covered by a thin layer of dirt. Is it any wonder their spirits have been restless all these years? Fort Griswold is now a museum where the sword of Colonel Ledger, wiped clean of his blood, is on display. That's not all that's on display at Fort Griswold. Many people have reported hearing the voices of soldiers long dead. Strange orbs sometimes appear within the fort, glowing ominously. Often a foreboding mi mist rises from the ground. The battle for Fort Griswold ended centuries ago, but for the soldiers who fought and died there, it's still going on. Afterward, these chilling tales, each haunting on its own, unique way, are bounded by a common location, the great state of Connecticut, which is home to more specters, haunts, and legends than the pages of this book can contain. These mysteries and many more await all who set foot in Connecticut. Perhaps you will someday encounter the Green Lady or the Headless Horseman or even the Black Dog of the Hanging Hills. Each one carries a message from beyond, a message that is an essential as it is mysterious. That's it for that book. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope my voice was soothing. And hopefully relaxing.